I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And verses 1 to 12. These are uh, the, the Beatitudes, part of the Sermon on the Mount, the, the blessings, the people that God blesses and the way he blesses them. And it's not the way that we would bless. It's not the way that we often, even here in our churches, that we're going to be blessed. Because Jesus takes the spirit of this world, he takes the ideas of this world, and he turns them upside down. On Friday, we're going through Andrew Murray's book on humility. And just reading it, it just turns everything upside down. It's saying if you want to be exalted, if you want to be the tops, if you want to be the best, um, you have to be the servant and slave of everyone. And um, this just turns everything upside down. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them. That's the disciples. Okay, it's not the world. It's not the Roman Empire. It's not the Jewish authorities. It's his disciples. And we have to understand that. People who don't even know God try and keep the Beatitudes. It's impossible. And he opened his mouth and taught the disciples, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word and we ask that you will open up your word to our hearts as well as our minds so that, Lord, intelligently we can understand and approve of your wonderful word. But, Lord, most of all, in our hearts that we can be transformed by your word. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now, I said that Jesus was teaching his disciples for a reason, okay? Because I don't want us to get the impression that this is a beatitude for everybody. That everybody can be a peacemaker. That everybody can come and bring peace to this world that desperately needs peace. It's not for everyone. We need to emphasize once again that we are not speaking about natural human qualities and abilities. We're not talking about a diplomat. We're not talking about diplomacy. We're not talking about trying to get two enemies together. We're not trying here to solve that kind of a situation. The Beatitudes are written for Christians and only for Christians. Blessed are the peacemakers is written to the normal Christian believer. When we look at this beatitude, we must forget the United Nations. We must forget the Nobel Prize, Peace Prize winners and the good but feudal efforts of human peace agreements and peace initiatives. Of course, they're good. And they, you know, anybody that tries to bring peace in this world is to be commended. But they are futile. And they will not succeed in the way that a peacemaker who is a Christian can succeed 
in this life. So we must forget the United Nations. Forget the Nobel Peace Prize winners. Because blessed are the peacemakers. It's for the child of God and the church of God. Jesus is teaching his disciples, not the Roman or the Jewish authorities. Today, Jesus is teaching the church, not the United Nations. They have their own agenda. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. We are sons of God. The United Nations cannot possibly be called the sons of God. The Nobel Peace Prize winners, how wonderful they are, are not Sons of God, you are. We are. And the Beatitudes show us that God is establishing an entirely different kingdom. We have seen this from the attitude of the Jews. The Jews thought that Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, had come to kick out the enemies of, 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 of the Jews, kick out the enemies of, of Israel, establish an earthly kingdom, be, be finished with the Roman Empire and, and, and uh, the, this, this, this earthly kingdom of Jews was going to now be heaven on earth. And Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus did not come with a political agenda. Jesus did not come with a military agenda. Jesus came to set up his own kingdom. No longer just for Jews, but for the Gentiles, for Greeks, for Englishmen, for Norwegians, for Filipinos, for Palestine, Palestinians, for, for, for the whole world. There would no longer be just Jew, there would also be Gentile. And we are sons of God. It's an entirely different kingdom. This is why religion can never bring anything but confusion and disappointment. It doesn't matter what we call ourselves. It doesn't matter what our label is. It doesn't matter what we call ourselves Baptist or, or, or Pentecostal or Lutheran or Roman Catholic or Hindu or, or Muslim, whatever we can call ourselves, what we, what we want to. But that doesn't save us and it doesn't make us peacemakers and it doesn't make us children of God. So what is a Sermon on the Mount believer? What is a, a Beatitude Believer, As we have seen, once again, this is not a natural human ability. This is not something we try to be because we cannot be. I cannot be empty by myself. I cannot mourn over my own sin and my own weakness without the help of God. I cannot be meek because I want to be strong. I cannot be the servant of everyone because I want to be the leader of everyone. And so the Beatitudes are not for the world. They're not for the religious Christian. And it's not a natural human ability. I've said this about some of the other Beatitudes. You know, there are people that are naturally meek. There are people that are naturally um, mourning over, uh, over their, 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 their inabilities and, and, and always apologising for themselves. There are people who read the Bible and naturally they want to be like this book. They read the life of Jesus and they think no one ever was as kind and good and sacrificial as this man. I want to be like Jesus. You cannot. You cannot. Not with our own human efforts. It takes a transformation. We have to become something before we can do something. 
It's not a natural human ability. For, and, and that's good, because what it means is that if, you, if we don't have these natural human abilities, God can give, the, uh, give them to us. If we're not naturally meek, if we're not naturally sacrificial to others, if we're not naturally loving, God can give these attributes to us. It would be very difficult for us if only those who had that natural ability of being meek could be meek. But God opens up a whole new possibility that he can transform the proud to being humble. That he can transform the unloving to being loving. That he can tra transform people who have been hurt and crushed and betrayed by this world and are carrying a huge weight on their shoulders, he can transform us to being free. Firstly, a Sermon on the Mount peacemaker is not quarrelsome. I mean, I mean we should understand that. Uh, a quarrelsome man <laughs> cannot be a peacemaker. So if I'm quarrelsome, if I, at the, you know, the, the, the very faintest sign of, uh, of, of opposition or difficulty or you don't agree with me, become quarrelsome and, and prickly and oversensitive, I'm not going to be a very good peacemaker. I'm not going to be very good at that. I think I'll bring peace to this situation. I'll bring peace to this person who doesn't agree with me. And then, you know, I, I don't know, it could be could be anything, couldn't it be? It could be over baptism. You know, I believe in baptism by full immersion after coming to faith in Jesus Christ. But my brother here, he believes in infant baptism. And so I think I'll be a peacemaker. So, uh, and then he starts calling me a, 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 a hypocrite. And he, uh, why isn't our baptism good enough for you? And then I start... What? Your baptism? It's, it's not biblical. It's, not, it, it's in the Bible. And, and, and before you know it, we're, we're arguing over theological stances. And I got so quarrelsome. I cannot be a peacemaker. A peacemaker stands his ground. You, 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 you're sure of what you believe, but you're not intimidated by other beliefs. You know, if you go on YouTube... And you go on and, and you hear an atheist and you're intimidated by that, what that atheist uh, is saying, then I suggest that you read your Bible. I suggest that you listen to the right preachers, read the right books, because we shouldn't be intimidated. We should love them. We should want to win them for Jesus Christ. But we should be peacemakers. Our peacemaker isn't a diplomat. A peacemaker doesn't compromise. But a peacemaker... Is sure in God. You know, we, we just had that wonderful Ukrainian worship song. And it, and it was really talking about being sure in God. I'm sure of my God. I'm sure of what I believe. And if you're sure of what you believe, you won't be quarrelsome with those that, that, that think differently. Because you won't feel intimidated. You won't feel, what if they're right? If you really believe in Jesus Christ and really believe in the Bible. So we cannot be quarrelsome. But a peacemaker is not someone who wants to avoid conflict at all costs. A peacemaker is not content just to leave things as they are. I don't want to upset anybody. He's not looking to maintain a quiet, uneventful existence. What a powerful church. He desires peace, he produces peace, and he maintains peace. He actively seeks peace between man and man, group and group, nation and nation. But a Sermon on the Mount peacemaker is mainly concerned about the biblical truth that all men and women need to be at peace with God. And one of the, the real hallmarks of being a Christian is to have peace. Peace with God. I was, I was never an uh, atheist. I'm not 
was never clever enough to be an atheist. Um, I was never a, an agnostic because I never found out the meaning of the word. Um, and I was told, you know, that um, we, it all happened. It, we, didn't, had, we hadn't discovered the Big Bang then, actually. So, you know, I, 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 I was hearing everywhere that, uh, you, you know, we, we sort of evolved from this sort of tiny little, you know, I'm not, you've, there are probably scientists here. I'm not going to get into hot water here. I'm a, I'm a theologian. But anyway, that's what I was told, you know. And, and there is no God. And, 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 you know, I used to, I used to sort of um, think, hmm, I just don't know. I didn't know whether God existed. I didn't know whether there was a God. So when I started going to the Christian church with, with Marilyn and, and, and hearing the gospel, you know, I, I didn't know whether Jesus dying on the cross uh, for my sins was true or not because I didn't know whether God existed. So my problem was, does God exist? And what always stopped me from being an atheist, well, you saw a little bit of it on, um, on, on, on Friday with the, the eclipse of the, uh, of the sun, but you know some of hey, the northern lights. Hey, you saw the northern lights for the first time, you poor things. If, you, if you'd lived in Finnmark and North Norway, where it really is tough, you would have seen them many, many times in all Beautiful colours, pinks and blues and green, greens. Anyway, it was great. You know, that, that, it, it's that sort of thing that stopped me from being an atheist. And when I used to see on, on holiday and I would see the sun setting over the Atlantic Ocean with a, the golden sands of, 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 of the North Cornish coast, you know, there was something that said, this didn't just happen. But the day that I became a Christian, the day that I got saved, something happened. I had that, that peace of God. It's not an arrogance, it's a security. It's not pride, it's assurance. I know my Redeemer lives. I know that Jesus is the Son of God. I know that he died for me, as awful as I am. And I know he loves me. And I have that peace. He's the rock. And I have that peace. What does it involve in order to be a peacemaker? To be a Sermon on the Mount peacemaker, we've already seen some of the, the, what we need. Uh, we need to have a new heart and a new nature because that gives us new motives, new desires, new loves. A peacemaker needs a, a pure heart. We need to have that, that, that pure, innocent heart. A peacemaker needs meekness and humility. Otherwise, he will be quarrelsome. The person who is empty of self, mourning over his own sin, and clothed with meekness is spiritually equipped to be a peacemaker because he certainly won't be uh, uh, superior. She certainly won't think she's better than anybody else because she knows that it's only by the grace and mercy of God that she is able to be a peacemaker. A selfish, touchy, unpredictable nature that lacks empathy and compassion can never be a peacemaker. And I'm talking about Christians. If we're Christians, if we're born again, if we love the Lord Jesus, but we're, we're touchy and unpredictable and, and you know, selfish, in the, it's always about me. You know, it's always about me and, 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 and where I am and my interests. And I don't have any empathy. I don't understand anybody. I don't understand how you can be like that. I don't understand how you can feel like that. I can never be a peacemaker. Oh, it's all your fault. I don't have any compassion. It's, it's your fault. I'll never be a peacemaker. Do we want to be Sermon on the Mount peacemakers? Well, if I want to, I must stop looking at every situation in my life in terms of how it affects me. How does this affect me? And I do it without even thinking. But that is the very attitude that destroys peace. Because I selfishly look at everything as it affects me. What is the 
effect on me from this? How is that going to affect me? Is that going to disturb my beautiful life? How will this situation affect my life? What is this situation going to cost me? Is this fair to me? How does this affect my rights? If that is my attitude, if that is our attitude, we can never be peacemakers. But if we are empty, meek and poor in spirit, we will not be fighting for our rights and asking, what about me in all this? When Jesus came, he humbled himself. He was God. And he trapped himself willingly in a human body. I mean, who would, would you want to do that if you were God? He humbled himself and died in my place. So I have a good example as to why. I shouldn't feel like this. But if we are empty and meek and poor in spirit, then we can be peacemakers. And when we truly understand that outside of Christ, we are nothing, and that in my flesh dwells nothing good, as Paul said, we will see other people differently. If I realise that really in me there doesn't dwell anything good, because I'm as big a sinner as the next person. I might just be a civilised sinner, okay? I cover it up with my suit and my tie, you know, all from Marks and Spencers. You know, and, um, you know, and, and I can cover up. I can cover up a lot of my sins. But while I have the attitude that I am better than anybody else in this world, I can never be a peacemaker. And I never really know myself. You know, one, one of the things about total depravity is that it affects every area of our life. It affects everything. But I think every one of us in this room, I, can, I think I can say absolutely safely, every one of us in this room, we are not as bad as we could be. We're not as bad as we could have been. Put us in a different situation. Put us maybe in a different country. Put us under a different regime. Take away our education. Take away uh, uh, you know, our, our loving family. Take away our good mum and dad and our brothers and sisters who were kind to us. And put us in a different environment. Now, I'm not going to say that we would end up being Adolf Hitler. I'm not saying that at all. But we wouldn't be as good as we are. I, I believe that we... By the grace of God and, and, and by our upbringing and our education and, our, and, and, and wonderful families, we're not as bad as we could be. But when I think that because I'm not as bad as I could be, that I'm actually good, then I am really distancing myself from the word of God that declares me a sinner and I'm totally depraved. It doesn't mean that I'm as bad as I could be in every area of my life or in any area of my life, but it does mean that that depravity is affecting my whole life. And only when I realise that will I understand other people, will I be concerned about others, will uh, I want their best. Only when I realise the truth of myself will I understand that men and women are governed and controlled by the God of this world just as I was. I just lived for myself before I became a Christian. I was a good guy. I made friends very easily. I was quite popular. Good diplomat. English people, good diplomats, you know. Quite popular. Didn't have many enemies. Didn't want any enemies. But I was totally selfish. I was saving up for a, a sports car. Now, doesn't that define the male ego? You know, I wanted my first open-top sports car. Never got it. Got married instead. But uh, <laughs> Better than any sports car. Almost as good as an Audi. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> anyway. It's only when 
I realise what I am. That I will know that other people are not worse than me. They just haven't met Jesus. Other people are not worse than me. They just haven't yet had the glory of knowing God. And knowing that God has totally forgiven me and totally loves me in spite of myself. We will know that man and, and, and woman is, is hell-bound unless we can become peacemakers and lead them to Jesus. And instead of hate, there is pity. Instead of tension and, uh, and, uh, and, and war, there is this desire to bring peace to the situation. The Sermon on the Mount Peacemaker has only one concern, and it is the glory of God amongst men. Not the glory of me amongst men. I can't do anything to help anyone. I'm just a sinner saved by grace, the same as we are all sinners saved by grace. And if you're not, then you are a sinner who needs to be saved by grace. I'm no different to you. And our only concern is the glory of God amongst men because we have no glory. There is no good thing in me apart from God, apart from Christ. And the peacemaker spends his life trying to minister to that glory. How does a peacemaker bring glory to God? What does a peacemaker do? Firstly, we must learn to control our tongues. You cannot be a peacemaker. I cannot be a peacemaker if I cannot control my tongue. If only we could learn, if only I could learn to control my tongue, there would be far less conflict, discord and misunderstanding in the world. James says, be quick to hear, okay, quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. I'm very good at being slow to hear. I don't want to know. I don't want to hear. I don't want to know. Quick to speak. Oh, I got it. I know it. I know it. I, I can tell you. I, I can solve your problems. And quick to anger. Why don't you listen to me? Why don't you understand me? But James says, no, no, no. Be quick to hear. Yes, okay. Yes, okay. Yep, yeah, okay. And slow to speak. And very slow to anger. Who said the Christian life is easy? <laughs> Who said, come as you are and God loves you and uh, it's all going to be a breeze. I can't even control my tongue. This surely is one of the best ways to be a peacemaker. Pastor Rob, control your tongue. When something unkind is said to us, the temptation is to reply in anger. Don't do it. Resist the temptation, he says to himself. Don't do it. Resist the temptation. And do not repeat things that are said in confidence. Do not repeat things spoken to you when you know there is a danger that they could do harm. Mo well, no, no, I won't say most of us because we are really a very lovely church at TRC. But there are some Christians, okay, who uh, they love a bit of gossip. Oh, 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 I just cannot keep that to myself. Oh, that is, you know, uh, of course, I'll never tell a soul. No, no, no. It is strictly between you and I and 150 other people <laughs> that I'm going to tell. No, um, it's, it's just in us. Because, you know, gossip is, is it's interesting. I mean, I mean, if gossip wasn't interesting, we wouldn't want to spread it around, would we? I mean, who wants to spread boring gossip? Who, who wants to spread what, you know, what, what they say in, in Parliament on a, on, on a Monday? Or if you ever see Prime, Prime Minister's Question Time, please don't, you know. When you know how the, the, the country of Britain is run, uh, you will just, you know, you will just despair. No, but, but you know, gossip is interesting. You know, gossip is something that I just cannot keep that to myself. And then what was said strictly between the person who unloaded themselves and me is now strictly between me and the other 42 people in this room. Okay. This is strictly between us. You're not to tell a soul, he said, to 50 people. <laughs> oh, man and woman of great faith. Okay. And you're not a true friend if you're gossip. And unkind. 
You know, we want our friends to be kind. We don't want them to be gossiping and saying unkind things about us. Unworthy or unkind things are, are not worth repeating. Really? <laughs> no, they're not. Okay. Okay, they're not worth repeating. Listen, you will never be a peacemaker if you cannot be discreet. We must learn to control our tongues and our lips. And the word of God tells us that, not just in James, but it tells us in, in a number of places. Because we all need to know. Because it's something we all need to battle with. Is your conversation always about yourself? Well, I, I've had a good week. You know, I did this, I, I did that. Is it always about your life, your situation? That will have to change if we want to be peacemakers. As Christians, we're meant to live as new men and women who are part of a new kingdom. That's what Jesus said. It's a new kingdom. We are to live our lives after the image and pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ. The peacemaker views any and every situation in the light of the gospel. If we only we could remember that, in the light of the gospel, what would God want me to do? What would God want me to say? How would God want me to think about this? The peacemaker views any situation in the light of that gospel. As we face the daily difficulties, joys and experiences of our lives, peacemakers must think further than simply, how does this affect me? We have to think, how does this affect Christ? How does this affect the gospel? How does, what does the Bible have to say? about this how would this affect others how would this affect the church how can i bring peace into this situation how can i be a peacemaker a peacemaker doesn't just bring peace when it's easy and comfortable jesus says if your enemy is hungry feed him that is not really what i would like to read about my enemy when i when my enemy is hungry <laughs> I am really happy. Okay. But Jesus said, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Yeah, I know what I'd like to feed him. You know, that's the way we feel. You know, but if your enemy is hungry, feed him. That is not, that would not be in my religion. Okay, now, now if I started my own religious, uh, religious organisation, um, the Pastor Rob End Time Church or something, you know. Um, uh, if your enemy is hungry, feed him would not be... Uh, it, it, that, that would be removed. Okay, that would be removed. I mean, we, we may be able to say something about our enemies. I might be able to say, well, Lord, I didn't lose my temper and I didn't say anything bad about him. That's good. And I, I'm praying for my enemies. That is good also. I'm praying that God will save my enemy because he sure needs it. That's also good. But the peacemaker goes further. His enemy is hungry. Things have gone wrong in his enemy's life. His enemy doesn't have the peace of God that passes all understanding that, that we have. Our enemy may have money, he may have power, and he may be very, very um, nasty, but he's to be pitied. Because he doesn't have what we have. He doesn't have peace with God. He doesn't have salvation. He doesn't have the forgiveness of his sins. Otherwise, he wouldn't be an enemy. The enemy is hungry. Things have gone wrong in his life and the peacemaker must try to take the initiative and bring love, hope, help and peace. And that does go against the grain with me. That is not easy for me to do. The responsibility of a peacemaker is to bring peace wherever we are. We do this by being unselfish, gentle, kind, lovable, approachable and open. Easy. <laughs> well, I think approachable and open, uh, I'm not so sure about the rest of them. I'm sure we can find things here. No, but we're to be all these. We're to be unselfish, gentle, kind, lovable, approachable and open. People will come to approachable people. They really will. People will come to open people. People will come to discreet people. 
If people know that you can keep a secret, if people know that you're compassionate, if people know that you're understanding and you're approachable and you're, you're, you're open, they will come. Just give it time. They will come. Let us try to be people that others will come to. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. The word called means owned. We could say, for they shall be owned as the children of God. And who owns us? God owns us. We're the children of God. God is going to own them. God is going to own us. The peacemaker is a child of God and he is to be like his father. A wonderful description of God is found in Hebrews 13, 20. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ. In the letter to the Romans, Paul speaks about the peace of God. The peace of God. Paul prays that the readers of this letter will be granted peace by God our Father. Why did God become a man. Why did the eternal word of God become a man? Why did the Son of God ever come into this world? Because God, though he is holy and just and righteous and absolute in all his qualities, and we are not, he's a God of peace. That's why he sent his Son. Where do wars come from? Where does hatred come from? Where does jealousy and selfishness come from? They come from man, from sin, and originally from Satan. And we are destroyed by our sinful nature that always puts self first and tries to live a life without God. But even though we were enemies of God, which it says in the New Testament, we were enemies of God, he did not leave us to die without forgiveness reconciliation and the ability to live a totally new and different life. He has come. He has done something about our helplessness. Why? Because he is the God of peace. That is a name for God, the God of peace. It's because he is the God of peace. God is a peacemaker. God sent his son and provided a way of salvation for us. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. That is why his children are to be peacemakers, because we are children of God. To be a peacemaker is to be like God and like the Son of God. Jesus Christ is called the Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. And we are his followers. We are the children of the God of Peace. Christ did not need to come to this earth. He came to make peace between God and man. He didn't need anything. He wouldn't be God if he needed anything. In, in some ways, the theist is right. God lives outside of this, this earth. He lives outside of all our problems. Because if he was part of this earth in, in, in that way, he wouldn't be God. He doesn't need anything. He doesn't need you, and I don't have a problem with that. He doesn't need me either. Now, I do have a problem with that. But he doesn't need me. I like to think he does, but he doesn't. He's God, and I'm not. But he chose, in his mercy, in his love, in his grace, to provide a way of salvation for us. That is why his children are to be peacemakers, because we are children of God. The Prince of Peace. He didn't need to come to this earth. He came to make peace between God and man. How did he make peace? Well, Paul, writing to the Colossians, says, having made peace by the blood of his cross. Having made peace by the blood of his cross. Christ gave himself that you and I might have peace with God, peace within our hearts, and peace with each other. That's real peace. Peace with God, that comes relatively easy, you know, because he did it all by grace. So I have peace with God. I know because God declares I have peace with God. I can have peace within. That's more difficult. 
because I find it diff difficult to forgive myself. I, uh, anybody else here have a, have a, a guilt problem? A, a, a guilt, you know, you, you carry around guilt, you, you're guilty of this, and you go, I, I am the, I tell you what, if, if you think you're good, you're just my disciple. You know, I, I am the chief of guilt. But we have peace within. God has made peace in our own hearts so that we can forgive ourselves. And then he's made peace with others. Do you know sometimes it's easier to forgive other people than it is to forgive yourself? Not always, but sometimes it is. He made peace. Peace with God. Peace within. And peace with others. Paul also writes in Ephesians 2, verses 14 to 16, for he himself is our peace. He himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Now, it's... It's, oh, it's, it's English language for most of it. It's not our, not our, our first language. But, but what Paul is writing here is that Jesus himself is our peace. And he has made both of us one. He's broken down the wall of hostility. He's broken down the wall of, of enmity. He's broken down the wall of our traditional enemies. He's broken that down. It's all broken down. There's no hostility. A North Korean Christian and a South Korean Christian, they're brothers in Christ, even though their, their countries are at war with one another, at least a war of words, sometimes more than that. The black South African and the white South African are reconciled in Jesus Christ. Even Scotsmen and Englishmen are reconciled in Jesus Christ. Norwegian and Swedes! <laughs> Almost. <laughs> well, <laughs> Terry is working on that. Okay, he's working on that. Jew and Palestine. It's broken down in Christ. A few years ago, I was, I was in Heimdall, and uh, I baptised a, 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 a wonderful, wonderful man. Uh, uh, his name was Reza from, from Iran. And Reza was a, a middle-aged man who, who wonderfully came to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and I baptised him. And it was a, a wonderful uh, example of reconciliation. Because here was me, a Gentile, an Englishman, baptising a man from Iran... And the man that pronounced the blessing over Reza was a Jewish rabbi who is a Messianic Jew. In other words, he believes in Jesus. Jesus. We're reconciled because he came. Jesus did not cling to his right to be absolute God. He humbled himself and took upon himself perfect humanity. Why? He didn't gain, as I said, anything for himself because he was God. He had everything. He took upon himself our humanity in order to bring peace. And to do this, he had to humble himself and die a death, even death on the cross. He was not thinking of himself. Coming to a close now, but I just want to read from Philippians, who's one of my uh, favourite portions in God's word about the humility of Jesus. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being of full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. 
Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is to be our attitude. That is to be the attitude of a peacemaker. That is the teaching of the Bible. You come to Christ for forgiveness and a new life. And you are done with self. We realise what it cost Jesus to bring us peace and a glorious new life. And we want others to have this life as well. That's our, the, our agenda. That's really what is on our heart. You cannot be content to live this life without others coming to enjoy it too. So forgetting self, we humble ourselves and follow in the steps of Christ. God, give us the grace to live like this and love like this. Make us examples that can reproduce in our lives the life of a peacemaker, a follower of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, and truly children of the God of Peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Father, we thank you for your love towards us. We thank you, Lord, that even while we were yet sinners, you died for us. You did not leave us, but you have given us peace with God, eternal life, great joy, the assurance, Lord, of the forgiveness of our sins. And we look forward, Lord, to the day when we will see you face to face. But we thank you, Lord, that while we remain here on earth, you have called us not to live for ourselves, but to live for one another. Not to live for ourselves, but to be a peacemaker. Lord, you have given us your peace. Help us to give your peace to others by being a peacemaker. Amen.